listening to realagriculture.com. Get real and get connected. Richard Gray of the University of Saskatchewan here at uh, the Saskatchewan Wheat Meeting at uh, at Farm Progress Show in Regina. And Richard, you're talking about export basis, and uh, of course, we've seen basis levels come down from uh, from where they were last year. But uh, but you're saying that probably isn't just a, a one time one time issue for farmers in Western Canada. That's right. Uh, the the very large crop that we had, particularly in 2013, actually created two years of very high export basis levels. The, the system needed to ration the capacity to the west coast. They did that by lowering farm prices relative to Vancouver, and that caused uh, basically high basis levels for a couple of years. The current situation for this coming year looks like basis levels may return almost to normal or historical normal levels um, because of the drought and other things. However, you look at the long-term trend, we've seen a very significant growth in uh, the volume of grain exports over time, partly because producers have adopted uh, more intensive production practices. We've seen volume of grain increase, and that's going to put pressure on the railways to move more grain in the future. We're going to see more large crops in the future, and every time we have one of those, we're going to see high basis levels. So, as you said, the, the drought this year, though, and, and it's looking like maybe a smaller crop that could, could help things. Yeah, if we do, certainly if it's realized that we have a smaller crop, that could bring basis levels back to normal. If the crop is bigger than we expect, maybe we'll have high basis levels even next year. It's still a weather issue right now. So what, what do you think it would take to, to fix this issue for, for farmers? Or, or uh, what are some of the, the steps that could prevent this from happening again? Well, the, the big issue is increasing capacity through the West Coast. Uh, that's got to do with rail performance and it's got to do with uh, building port capacity. For the rail performance, uh, I think uh, we should work within the revenue cap, but actually have additional incentives for railways to move grain during the winter months. They don't get paid any more for moving grain in the winter than they do in the summer. It's more difficult to move then. so. To use that capacity, we need some better incentives to move in the winter time. Uh, we also um, need uh, better supply chain logistics. I mean, we, when the system gets backed up right now, there's nobody, there's no third party that can go in there and sort of sort things out and decide what grain moves. Right now, it's uh, more or less the railways decide what grain is going to move, and it plays havoc with loading boats and for the grain companies. So, we certainly need to, to sort that out. We need better public forecasting as well. I think that's really important, um, so that we, uh, so that we have a really good idea of the size of the crop. The railways aren't fooled, that, etc. Uh, and, and then I guess finally, um, if you'll come to me, <laughs> uh, we need more West Coast capacity, and and that I think requires. It's good that we've seen an announcement by the. The, the newest, and yeah, the new grain company, new G3, to build uh, port capacity. Um, that's great, uh, but we we need a lot more. Most of the capacity, most of the grain in, in Western Canada, its natural shipping route is going west. And if you consider that it it's going to go to Asia, and Asia is the growing market. Virtually all our grain should go west. And we don't have anywhere near enough capacity to move all our grain west right now. So we need more terminals, and. In order to get more terminals, we need to think about it as a term, uh, ports as a public uh, utility, if you like, and actually provide some uh, public incentives to, to actually increase port capacity. This is a multi-billion dollar issue that we need to deal with. So where's the, the bottleneck? Is it at the port or is it getting to? It's, it's both. Okay. Um, if there's limited capacity at the port, the railways can't that railways are not going to invest a whole lot, lot more in rolling stock and in locomotives. Similarly, if uh, they, the railways don't have a lot more capacity, they maybe won't invest as much in port capacity. But the, the bottlenecks really are in the port of Vancouver. There's not a lot of real estate, but G3 found some. I suspect there's other real estate there. Um, Prince Rupert is another port that certainly has room in real estate. The problem there is they it's served by one railway. Uh, and uh, if you're a grain company, you might not want to build in a location where your terminal is entirely dependent on one railway, when someday that railway may have the ability to price any way they like. So why is, why is the West Coast a priority, or, or is there opportunity for other 
Churchill or Thunder Bay? Is there opportunity? Well, possibly, possibly Churchill for some, you know, some of the eastern. Thunder Bay is basically too expensive. Basically, by the time you ship it to Thunder Bay, you put it in a lake or you move it through the St. Lawrence Seaway out to Montreal, um, and then then you're on the east side of Canada. And unless you're going to Europe, it's not very viable. In fact, even to ship to Europe, the cheapest route is to go uh, from Brandon to Vancouver through the Panama Canal versus uh, uh, shipping it east. So. That's for European shipments, which and that market's being saturated more and more with the Black Sea exports, etc. So, the growth markets are going to be in Asia, and that's up to our west coast. So that's even more of a pull to go west. So we designed a system to move east when a long time ago when Europe was our only market. Now it's no longer our primary, even it's a, at most a secondary market. The big push we need now is to build the capacity to go west and that requires some infrastructure at ports. Is there a place for Churchill after the incentive, the current incentive? It program? could be. Uh, you know, Churchill's, there's some rail line issues there but they uh, uh, certainly if, if uh, basis levels remain high I think there will be an opportunity to make, you know, the, Churchill may be continue to be viable. I think looking way down the road uh, as global warming kicks in and that port becomes more open for more months of the year, uh, I think there's there's a possibility of a, a good possibility of, of using the Northwest Passage, but we're not there yet. Uh, uh, but certainly, long run, that could be an important outlet for, if you like, uh, northeastern Saskatchewan. Uh, it, uh, so, uh, going back to your, your list of solutions or, or factors that could contribute to mitigating another transportation issue that we saw last year. Most of them would would require federal government action. Yes, I think so. Uh, at least at least some uh, there's some public role in most of those. Uh, public private probably uh, partnerships of, of sort. Uh, I think it, it is a multi billion dollar issue. I mean the, these issues for farmers are huge. A hundred dollars basis extra basis is a hundred dollars an acre. And if you have a thousand acres, that's a hundred thousand dollars. You got five thousand is five hundred thousand dollars off the check in one year. It's a big, big number. So I think it's a really important issue for producers to address so these basis issues here. and it should become uh, something that the all of federal parties should be looking at. Especially in an election year, it could be an issue this year. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's uh, we, we can't forget the basis as, as being a, a very important issue the last couple of years, and it will become an issue in the future. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Richard. Thank you.